I'm Julio Malera, CEO of 1012 Industry Report, and on behalf of our sponsors this morning, the Alliance Safety Council, Bradley Merkinson, and the Port of Greater Baton Rouge, we'd like to welcome you to this special presentation on the 1012 Industry Report webcast. Today's presentation and panel discussion is focused on the future of energy in our state. But before we get started this morning, uh, we have a couple of partners who've made today's webcast possible. And I'd like to first introduce Ms. Kathy Trahan, the CEO of Alliance Safety Council. Kathy? Hi. Good morning. As experts in safety compliance and time-saving technology solutions in the petrochemical utility and the manufacturing sectors, Alliance Safety Council has always been focused on being good stewards of the resources entrusted to us by the owner and contractor communities so that we can look out as far as we can see. We join other experts. So we're really excited to be a part of this and we look thrilled to joining, we're thrilled at joining you today. So enjoy. Thank you, Kathy. Next is Mr. Jerry Jones with Bradley Merkinson. Jerry, welcome. Thank you, Leo. It's great to be here today. Uh, we at Bradley Merkinson have been working with the oil and gas industry for actually um, over eight decades through our predecessor attorneys and we worked uh, with with uh, the production folks, pipeline folks, even more recently with world scale uh, manufacturing facilities that use gas as a feedstock. Now we're excited as we look forward to wind, solar, carbon sequestration, but today we're just excited to hear what Scott and uh, Dr. Scott have to tell us about the future of the industry. We're looking forward to it. We think the future's bright and we're glad to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, last but certainly not least, Mr. Jay uh, Hardman in the port of Greater Baton Rouge. Jay, welcome. Julio, good morning. On behalf of myself, our commissioners, staff at the port of Greater Baton Rouge, always an honor to participate in one of these talks. And as y'all know, port of Greater Baton Rouge has been heavily steeped in the movement of petroleum, uh, either unrefined or refined petroleum products. And, and with the <laughs> perspective of having uh, Grand Fuels join us with probably one of uh, world scale renewable diesel uh, project here at the port. We're excited. We're excited to hear what Dr. Scott and Scott Angel have to say. You'd ask me to give a little update on the port. Well, if you check out business reports, uh, annual report 2021, page 30 and 31 gives a good recap of what's going on at your port here in the greater Baton Rouge region. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it back over to you and JR and look forward to hearing what these two gentlemen have to say. Well, thank you again, Jay, you, Kathy, and Jerry. Without you, uh, your support, this is not possible. So uh, now we're ready uh, for our presentation and to uh, kick it off, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator and the executive editor, Mr. J.R. Ball. J.R., it's all yours. Thank you, Julio, and good morning to our audience. Our format today is it will begin with a 10 to 12 minute presentation from Scott Angel the former Director of Safety and Environment Enforcement for the U.S. Department of the Interior. We'll then turn to economist Lawrence Scott, who will share his analysis and insights. And then following Dr. Scott's presentation, I'll ask our guests some of the questions that were submitted in advance by our audience members. One final note before we begin, a recording of this webcast will be made available later today and can be accessed through 1012industryreport.com and this afternoon's Daily Report PM. So now we'll turn to Scott Angel, who while working at the U.S. Department of the Interior was the chief regulator of oil and natural gas exploration and production on the outer continental shelf. The Broad Bridge native served as secretary of the Louisiana Department of Natural Resources under two governors and has more than 30 years experience reforming agencies and organizations in both the private and public sectors. Scott, thank you for joining us this morning. I turn it over to you. Thank you, JR. It's uh, absolutely a delight uh, to be joined by uh, Dr. Lawrence Scott, a person who I've had the opportunity to work with, and certainly for Kathy, Jay, and Jerry, absolutely rock stars in their areas. I've worked with all of them, doing tremendous work for, for Louisiana, and I might say doing tremendous work for the United States of America. So great job. I'm excited about, again, sharing some facts with you. This is uh, a fact-based presentation, and I am really want to be complimentary of the Baton Rouge Business Report. Just have an opportunity to walk around this place, 
you kind of get the feel uh, that this place uh, really understands the Abraham Lincoln philosophy that every organization takes on the personality of its leader. So you see Ralph and you see JR in so many ways here uh, around here. So great job. And we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, again, a power pack, a lot of slides. Uh, and we're happy to kind of get through it with you. Uh, again, in this whole energy sector, I think one thing we need to really understand is that like in life, things change fast. And they certainly change fast for me. One day you had the White House in our nation's capital, and the next day you had the, waff the Waffle House in the crawfish capital. And so things change fast. They certainly change fast in the energy sector. And today we'll talk about those transition opportunities. Again, as things have changed, every generation has faced its challenges. And we certainly have a listing of some of those challenges here. And I think most of us would agree that certainly a challenge of our generation is climate change. I'm not here to persuade you whether or not climate change is real or it's not real. You all can review those facts and make your decisions. I'm here, however, to tell you that I absolutely believe that much of the world believes it's real and that there are governments that are taking certain actions in response to it. And Louisiana has an opportunity and a duty to be responsive to those things. And it's not just folks in certain areas and in certain demographics, it's actually a growing demographic support. And I will share with the audience that many young conservatives, many young conservatives across this country believe that we need to be more responsive to Mother Earth. Whether or not you believe it or not is not what I'm here for, but just to, I think, give you some facts and how we might respond to that. Uh, and while that whole issue of climate change is certainly uh, something that is on the forefront of a lot of minds, uh, I thought this was a pretty good headline that everything that is fabricated, grown, operated, or moved is made possible by hydrocarbons. So over 6,000 everyday products, and we do remain relevant. I mean, obviously you just take a look at that picture. We remain relevant as an industry, but I would caution everybody to understand and remember uh, Kodak, Blockbuster, Sears, three good examples. Uh, I remember as a kid that Kodak was so powerful as an entity that we coined a phrase in America, when you took your most special photographs, you called that a Kodak moment. Now you can't find Kodak with a flashlight. We all remember Sears, perhaps the world's number one retailer. And we all know that uh, Sears is uh, nothing compared to what it once was. So things change and we have to be reactive. As the wind is blowing in different directions, we need to adjust ourselves. And I will share with you that change doesn't mean death. It actually means survival. And I think we have uh, four good examples uh, there on the screen of where change was embraced and survival uh, and thriving resulted. So I think it's a very important that we do understand in this whole climate change issue, the, the opportunity for us in Louisiana is again to recognize that 194 governments representing approximately 75% of the world's population uh, has joined in, in, in this. Again, whether you believe it or not uh, is, is for you to decide. But I'm here to share with you that the Gulf of Mexico's gold star statement is that we can advance the health of our planet and meet our goals under the Paris Accord by substituting foreign source petrol production with more and not less U.S. offshore energy while simultaneously strengthening our domestic economy, national security, energy security, and saving jobs for American energy workers. I certainly understand that you can read it. I thought that statement was powerful enough for me to read it to you. It is uh, the cornerstone and the foundation of the rest of this presentation. And you can ask yourself, how can it possibly be that we're making a gold star statement that offshore production can help us achieve the goals of, of, of climate change? Well, I think we take a look at a few facts. Uh, it's certainly, you, we all need to understand that the Gulf of Mexico is a big deal. 15% of all USA oil production is from the Gulf of Mexico. And we have four oceans in this country, the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Arctic, and the Gulf. The Gulf of Mexico is the smallest of the four, yet it represents a huge production portfolio. 98% of the offshore oil that's produced in America comes from uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And 92% of that comes from deep water. So when we take a look at how can we make that statement, the first thing we take a look at is deep water Gulf of Mexico has a very, very small footprint. There are 68 production facilities representing only 4% of the production facilities in the Gulf that are responsible for 92% of the production. Incredible amount of production in this country comes from offshore, very few facilities, thus very little environmental footprint. That's an advantage. We need to take, take advantage of it. 
One thing that you begin to hear, I think more and more as we go forward, is that not all barrels are created equal. Global, global carbon intensity of crude oil production is not the same. This particular graph shows that the Gulf of Mexico deep water uh, carbon intensity, intensity ranks very, very favorable when you compare to the world. Again, uh, this is a very important observation. I doubt that many of the folks on this call are acutely aware of this. You need to be aware of this. This is one of the greatest advantages we have as we try to develop our economy in Louisiana and at the same time, make sure that we are contributing positively to the health of Mother Earth. Don't just take my words for it as a guy who strongly believes in the industry. Let's go back to a November 2016 report that was issued by the Obama-Biden administration. And I'm quoting directly from the report. Emissions from substitutions are higher due to exploration, development, production, and transportation of oil from international sources being more carbon intensive. So in November 2016, the facts were such that, as the previous administration laid out at that time, is that Gulf Gulf of Mexico emissions are far less intense than those that come from foreign sources. Again, that's not my words. That's the words of uh, the administration that was in place in November 2016. Again, more research. This shows more research about the lack of carbon intensity or the reduction of carbon intensity. Why is that important? 10 years ago, nobody on this phone call really even knew about carbon intensity. It now is such an important factor that 194 countries have memorialized their support of climate change and they look at carbon intensity as one of the problems associated with that. So this is important to your zip code and your area code. But it's not just about energy. When we think of the importance of it, certainly we think of the Great American Outdoors Act, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act. We in Louisiana have hooked our wagon of coastal restoration to oil and gas production and royalties. Uh, by constitutional amendment, uh, I think adopted in 2006, a uh, very, very uh, smart public policy that links the re restoration of renewable resources from the proceeds of non-renewable resources. And when we continue to think of the values of what goes on offshore, uh, one only has to talk to a recreational fisherman that enjoys the Gulf of Mexico and understand that we've had this tremendous success reefing nearly 600 platforms, uh, reusing platforms in such a way that provides uh, beneficial work. The Coastal Conservation Association has been a phenomenal partner for industry and the United States government and the state of Louisiana. So when we take a look at it, are you prepared uh, based to be able to uh, go out and begin to be an ambassador, if you would, uh, that the Gulf of Mexico is an environmentally advantaged province? Well, when you understand the five things that we have checked off here, that we've achieved uh, a ratio of less than 1.25% flared vented gas to produce gas, that makes us one of the best performing provinces in the USA. If methane is considered to be one of the causes of climate change, uh, we, 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 we have a solution to that. We have a very robust pipeline system in the Gulf of Mexico. We have a strong regulatory approach. We've had zero incidental marine mammal and sea turtle fatalities from the OCS uh, as a result of uh, ENP activity since at least 2017. I think if we're honest with one another, that if Boudreaux and Thibodeau at one time were on a platform and there was a vessel strike and that vessel strike resulted in a marine mammal or sea turtle fatality, uh, people would be talking about cutting the onions and the bell peppers and talking about a fish cubion. We now report that to the federal government. Uh, we, we, take, we take the marine life very seriously. And I think that, should, that goes very well as we get into some of these, these metrics. The, certainly we understand the event that happened in 2010. Uh, it's a whole different world offshore when you look at uh, oil spill volumes. There's been a lot of improvements, both by industry and by the regulator. Uh, again, we have some volumes there. Uh, hard to imagine, right, that in 2018, the ratio of volume spill to volume produced 13 tablespoons in an Olympic size swimming pool, swimming pool and in 19, 17 tablespoons. But Louisiana is more than a good for Mother Earth one trick pony. Uh, you all are acutely aware of some of the things that are going on in the existing LNG opportunities, approved but not yet, yet built opportunities, and those that are proposed. You cannot talk about LNG in America and in the United States without talking about Louisiana. I like to think that. We can brand something here in Louisiana as an opportunity 
called the Northwest to Southwest Global LNG Expressway. Uh, we have these tremendous volumes of natural gas in the Haynesville shale that can be easily moved and are being easily moved uh, to the Cameron Calcasieu area. We also have LNG opportunities that are beginning to pop up on the Southeast coast and perhaps St. Bernard and Plaquemine as well. And where is this gas going? Clean burning natural gas uh, produced by, explored for and produced by American workers sent to a facility on the coast of Louisiana and then sent uh, to the rest of the world. And when we send that, th th those molecules of gas, I think it's important that we understand that we don't just send energy, we send the opportunity for countries to free themselves from Russia uh, in a place that perhaps uh, they're not highly leveraged, that they get a little bit more independent and have the ability to embrace democracy, freedoms of religion, freedoms of speech, and all the good things that we enjoy in America. The more we can export that through our energy policy, creating American jobs is a win-win. So another, I think, good for Mother Earth energy pony that we have in this table is the whole concept about offshore wind energy. And offshore wind energy is the latest addition to the American offshore energy portfolio. I was happy to set up a management system uh, when I was with the federal government that embraced it. Uh, and how do we take advantage? I think uh, folks are beginning to believe that the wind fields of Northeast and the Atlantic, perhaps a little bit more superior than the wind fields of the Gulf of Mexico. So the harvesting of the wind may not happen here as much as it happens in other areas, but no doubt the expertise in the fabrication of offshore structures and vessels certainly make it the natural choice for this expanding industry. So, you know, we can think of all of those fabrication facilities, American jobs, building the facilities uh, that, that go offshore. And I know that many of those companies are already in that space right now. Suffice to say, I want you to walk away as we are going into this whole new world that the Gulf of Mexico is, is the world's energy transition zone. Again, whether or not you believe that we should be making an energy transition is not what I'm debating with you today. Again, I'm here to tell you that I believe the world, uh, that horse has left the barn and, and the world is beginning to transition. And our children will know many more energy sources than we know, and that's okay. I also would say, however, that as we are going through this energy transition zone, that few people are aware that more, not less energy from the Gulf of Mexico is better for our environment. As we substitute energy production from the Gulf of Mexico, create American jobs for energy that is more carbon intensive by using our less carbon intensive, it is a huge opportunity. Let's take a look at what others are saying. Don't just again believe me. Look at what Shell is saying. Shell, worldwide company, one of the absolute most phenomenal companies out there. Shell is saying they look into the Gulf of Mexico, lower carbon oil driven. Okay. Huge opportunity, huge employer, uh, you know, great, great company, great safety record, done a lot of good jobs, a lot of good things for this country, certainly for this state. Let's take a look at what Chevron saying. Chevron saying that they'll be action over pledges and they'll deliver. Uh, higher returns with lower carbon. And he specifically says, Mike Worth with Chevron, again, another fabulous company from Louisiana, talks about how the deep water Gulf of Mexico is one of those severe, serious opportunities as they match up with, with uh, lower carbon. Again, we have an opportunity in the Gulf of Mexico. We have great geology and we have a great pipeline system. We have great regulatory and we also have great people. But it goes beyond just the companies. Uh, I, I, I saw the governor recently made a statement uh, in the Baton Rouge Business Report. Uh, and I think that last sentence is the most important one. Uh, I think we can make a strong case. There are advantages for the environment to produce oil in the Gulf as opposed to other areas. And we're going to make that case as best we can. That's a pretty powerful statement that there is an environmental advantage to producing oil in the Gulf as opposed to other areas. When we talk about other areas, at least when I talk about other areas, I talk about Venezuela, I talk about Russia. I talk about an opportunity for this generation of Louisianians to export more oil. So we've experienced a few unbalanced times. I think we can all remember the oil embargo of 73, long gasoline lines. It shocked our economy, sent us into a recession. Uh, we introduced, we responded on that side because that was a supply challenge. 
We introduced 55 mile per hour national speed limit laws, energy efficiency, building codes. One of the, I think, most profound statements for us all to know is whether you like it or you don't, that, that in a lot of ways, our economy is linked to our affordable energy prices. Our nation has experienced six recessions from 1973 to 2019, and each were preceded by a spike in energy prices. As goes our nation's access to affordable energy, so goes our economic performance. And it's not just a problem for energy producing states, but it's a bigger problem for energy consuming states because it has negative impacts on housing, travel, tourism, restaurants, auto sales, and other discretionary spending. I couldn't help but notice a recent stat that I kind of stumbled on, that when we go through a period of flat energy prices, we experience high automobile sales in America. Well, flat energy prices are a function of supply and demand, and supply is about having access to the resources, where we can have access to the resources and we can unleash the American innovation. It's amazing what we can do. And I'm out there, I think, talking across America about a balance of the three E's. Somehow, some way, uh, energy became a red state issue and environment became a blue state issue. And I believe that there is a third E that needs to be talked about in incredible ways in this country. And that's the purple E. And that's the economy. And I think it is, in fact, like a three-legged stool. And we all know what happens when uh, things get out of balance. And how is that balance out there? Let's kind of take a look at what's going on. I, again, I saw this article. I mean, a year ago, we had negative oil prices. And I see an article on April the 27th, coming this summer, gas stations running out of gas, uh, talking about higher gasoline prices uh, coming to us by spring. We all know that has a detrimental impact on the nation's economy. So what is the path forward? The path forward is to understand that we do want to do more for Mother Earth. But we also need to understand that as we're doing more for Mother Earth, that we need to have a transition recognizing that if we're not careful, we're going to wreck our economy. And we don't have to predict that. We know that because, again, we've had six recessions from 73 to 2019, and each have been preceded by a spike in energy prices. So we need to do both. We need to be able to take care of our environment and take care of our economy. And we we have a history of doing that here in the Gulf of Mexico. We've historically counted on the hard hats and the steel toe boots of the Gulf of Mexico. Again, 1973, through the oil embargo of 73, supply was a problem. So we put our, our innovation to work in this country and the Gulf of Mexico responded. More wells, more production, resulting in more energy security, more national security, more economic security. Well, now the world is saying, or America is saying, you know, we've in a lot of ways, solved our energy supply. Now we want to be, we want to cherry pick and we want only energy that is environmentally advantaged. Guess what? The Gulf of Mexico is that place. It gives us a tremendous opportunity. And when we take a look at production, production in the Gulf of Mexico uh, year over year has continued to grow in terms of the oil production. Uh, obviously, 2020 is going to be a retreat from those numbers based on the pandemic. Uh, but there's a lot of runway left in the Gulf of Mexico. And when you understand the carbon intensity, when you understand the oil spill metrics, when you understand the marine mammal and sea turtle metrics, we have a really great story to tell. Uh, and what have we done? I mean, again, go back to 1973. We adopted a law in 1975 after the oil embargo that made it against the law, but in very rare, very rare situations that we can actually export oil to other parts of the globe. That was revoked in, in, in December of 2015. And we, we have proven, we have proven that we have the ability to get it. We have the metrics to support the environmental side and we can, we can substitute our production for some of the inferior productions that's coming from other parts of the globe. And again, 194 countries represent 74% of the world's population have already memorialized their support for that. So we have a willing buyers and we need a, I believe a government policy here in the country that understands that not all barrels are created equal, that the Gulf of Mexico is in fact, this incredibly uh, in environmentally superior area. And like we say, I, I guess back in, in the rural parts, 
we can have our cake and eat it too. We can have more production and we can have more opportunity uh, to help Mother Earth. The Gulf of Mexico is ready. All you got to do is take a look at all of these places. I mean, Jay as a sponsor, uh, I know work with uh, Baton Rouge business. I mean, the Mississippi River is so obviously important and all of these ports just come together. We're ready to roll. Uh, we have a story to tell. I need you to get informed, know the facts about the environmental advantages of, of the Gulf of Mexico production. Recognize that our hard hat and steel toe boot wearers of the Gulf of Mexico have already demonstrated their ability and that the Gulf has the lower intense carbon intensity of many foreign sources. We kind of wrap it up and I think a slogan that says uh, balance uh, to the third power there, eat to the third power, environment, energy, econ economy. And now we need to go tell it. I think our next exit is in fact a comeback and we appreciate the opportunity to be a part of it and share the stage with our distinguished colleague, Dr. Scott. Thank you, Scott. It'll be uh, interesting to see how uh, we as a state balance that three-legged stool of energy, environment, and economy. Uh, but now we'll turn to Lauren Scott, the president and founder of his eponymous economic consulting and public speaking firm, who makes more than 50 presentations annually on the state of the economy and its outlook with a specialization in the energy sector. Uh, the Sage from Wink, Texas is a member of the National Business Economic Issues Council, a 32-person group that meets quarterly to discuss issues of state, national, and international interest. <clears throat> he has been appointed to the Economic Advisory Board of the U.S. Council on Competitiveness, which is a group made up of CEOs of the Fortune 100, top university presidents, and presidents of the three major unions. Scott, currently Professor Emeritus of Economics at LSU, also fancies himself as something of a struggling part-time comedian, which of course comes as no surprise to those of us who listen to his jokes during his annual forecast at the Louisiana, of the Louisiana Economy at Biz Reports Top 100 luncheon. So, Dr. Scott, the stage is yours. Thank you, JR. I appreciate that very much. I appreciate being able to follow uh, Scott on jail. A lot of people are not going to realize how much Scott did for the state of Louisiana in those four years he was in Washington for us. And uh, we really owe him a great debt of gratitude for everything that he did for us. Um, I am going to be chatting with you about the uh, impact of the energy transition on uh, the uh, Louisiana economy. And it's, I think I actually use a similar phrase that Scott did, and that is fasten your seatbelts. There are a lot of changes that are taking place. By the way, the new alert, there's a new COVID announcement that just came out today. The World Health Organization has announced that dogs cannot contract uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, so dogs previously held in quarantine can now be released. Uh, to be clear, uh, who let the dogs out? Now, um, as we look at the energy outlook, there's both good news and some really bad news, I think, going on out there. The, the good news is what has happened to oil prices. This is a picture of what has happened to oil prices uh, since uh, 2019. When we went into the, right before we went into the uh, COVID shutdown, uh, the price of oil was hovering around $60 a barrel. And the good news is that it's come back to that level. I think Scott mentioned that there was one period, one day in which the price of oil was actually negative, but that was a peculiar peculiarity having to do with futures contracts and was not an indication of what's really out there that's real. But the good news is the price has come back and the price has come back well above the break-even point in the Gulf of Mexico, which is one of our key sectors for producing oil uh, in this state. So that's the good news. The bad news are the signals that the energy sector is getting from uh, the Biden administration, starting with the appointment of Deb Halen as the Interior Secretary. Uh, this lady has repeatedly called for an all out fracking ban. She's a big supporter of the Green New Deal. She wants a ban on drilling on public lands and waters. A key word there for us is waters for cause a great deal of our oil production comes from the Gulf of Mexico, which is federal land. She also wants to abolish the internal combustion engine. Um, President Biden himself has put a moratorium on lease sales on public lands and waters until at least this summer. So we were supposed to have had a lease sale in March, but to have another one coming up this fall, and those have been postponed for now. And until there is a study done uh, led by Ms. Halen here uh, on how 
uh, whether this is in the public's interest for this to take place. Now, importantly, there was a, on his first day in office, there was an important presidential memo that was released called Modernizing Regulatory Review. And this was actually, there was a great analysis of this by these two gentlemen in the Wall Street Journal the next day. And so basically what happens is when uh, regulations, uh, when, when laws are passed by Congress, they then send those to the various agencies in the, on, the, uh, on the executive side, and they have to make up the rules to make these, these new laws work. And there's an outfit called the Office of Management and Budget. And it is, it is, this office is to ensure that the new regulations that are brought up by the executive branch make sure that the benefits outweigh the cost of implementing these regulations. Well, this is what the presidential memo said. Ensure that the review process promotes policies that reflect new developments in scientific and economic understanding, fully accounts for the regulatory benefits that are difficult or impossible to quantify and does not have harmful anti-regulatory or deregulatory effects. So basically what that says, throw out all the traditional measures, use anything you can possibly find to promote the benefits of new regulations and whatever you do, in other words, you, if you find some obscure uh, uh, academic journal that suggests that there's some extra benefits that are difficult to quantify again, of course, accept those, but don't do anything that might impair any new regulations or remove old ones. So you can imagine as they look at the possible benefits and costs of having more um, lease sales in the Gulf of Mexico, which way this is going to lean under this administration. They canceled the permits for the Keystone XL pipeline. And you might say, well, what does that have to do with us? That's up in Nebraska and the, the, the Midwestern part of the United States. But Pups, the piping of Bittler Steel, pipe, stuck piping here in Baton Rouge, Bittler Steel at the port of Cato Bozier, all make piping. Uh, Bayou coatings over in the New Iber port of New Iberia, uh, they actually coat that pipe before it is put into, the, put into the ground. So the cancellation of that has ramification for us as well. Now, why, why is there this, this movement uh, to kind of against fossil fuels? Well, the intensity of these policy changes is based on the climate change being an existential threat to our existence, as it turns out. And we know this because uh, we allowed a 16-year-old from one of the Nordic countries to come and uh, speak in front of our Senate and House, U.S. Senate and House, <clears throat> and lecture and berate our, um, our senators and congressmen because we had not done enough to, uh, to address uh, climate change. And this very wise 16 year old has had a major impact, was a matter of fact named one of the, the time person of the year at the time. And then of course we have a former bartender who is now a Congresswoman who has told us that this is so bad right now that we've only got 14 years left before uh, our, we're, society, hum, humankind is gonna, just, is gonna essentially cease to exist. And you can see where they're coming from if you look at some of the data here. For example, this red line represents what has been happening to temperatures in the United States from 1961 through 2000 uh, and about 15. And you can see the red line. Now, no, notice starting in 19, early set, mid, the mid 70s, we've had this significant increase in temperatures uh, globally. And also look at the blue line. Look what has happened to CO2. Uh, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And as a result of that, as we are told, this is going to be, this is going to have a terrible impact on our ability to produce food. And you can see that, why they would say that, because if you look at coarse grain production, rice production, and wheat production, you can clearly see here that the trends are very in a very disastrous direction. Uh, now, there are some radicals out there that do point out that CO2 is actually a food for crops and for uh, forestry products, but still you, you can see how bad the trends are here in our grain production uh, globally. Uh, just this is very bad. Now notice this, not, this change started taking place in about the mid 1970s. And this is uh, some data on the uh, temperatures that existed in the world going back to 2000 BC going forward. 
And uh, the, uh, as you can see here, our temperature right now is a right in this range and it's rising. You can see it's been rising since about 1970. Very, very scary. And obviously, if you look back at the temperatures that are, uh, have been derived from core samples taken in ice melts uh, and, and, and glaciers, uh, you can see here that at, given where the temperatures are now, there's just no way that society is going to be able to exist. We have lessons from history. There's no way that society is going to be able to exist going forward. So this is an existential threat. And then if you, of course, if you look at the sea level rise, I got these data from Mr. Bunting um, over uh, at a, uh, a climate facility in uh, Saratoga, Florida. As you can see from 1850 to about 2015, look at this. Can you believe this? It is up eight inches since 1900. Do you realize that that's seven hundredths of an inch a year? How are we possibly going to adjust to that rapid sea level rise. I mean, that is no wonder people are concerned about this. As a matter of fact, the UN in 2005 said there were 50 million climate refugees because of sea level rise in 2010. Not just, you know, in a five year period. And one of the places they pointed to was the Maldives, this archipelago of about 25 coral atolls that were most at risk for sea level rise. Uh, and this is the kind of area where you can see this rapid increase in sea level rise is gonna be threatening. Now I will tell you that there are some absolutely silly capitalists out there who have still built 17 resort, resorts recently uh, under construction in the Maldives, but these are clearly people who do not understand the great threat of sea level rise. And then of course, uh, uh, from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I know you've been very worried. We've had a lot of rain lately, and then we've had some very dry periods not that long ago. And if you certainly, if you look at the data from January of 1895 through the present time period, and look at the very, very wet periods and the very, very dry periods, you can see here why people would be very, very concerned about this trend, that this is just something that's an existential threat to us. And then, of course, uh, we noticed a lot of uh, press lately on the uh, uh, fire, uh, forest fires and how out of hand those are and how that, you know, uh, climate change is causing this to get worse and worse. So if you look at the data from the NIFC and the government, uh, look at the data on wildfires from 1925 through the present time period. Once again, you can see that climate is just causing this to be a terrible, terrible threat to us. This is a real, really big problem. And then of course, here in Louisiana, we are very concerned about hurricanes uh, and, the, and the, the, the tremendous increase in the number and the, and the intensity of hurricanes. And the good news for us, the climateatlas.com has done some work for us from 1970 forward. What you see in the top line is the number of named tropical storms uh, by year. Uh, and then down at the bottom, you see the number of named hurricanes. And clearly you can see uh, from this, the, the tremendous, uh, the, the, the trend here is obviously very, very threatening to us. Now I will tell you, there are some, there are some skeptics that do point out that between 2005 and 2016, an 11 year period, not a single solitary hurricane hit uh, Florida. The, the longest time period in the recorded history of hurricanes, but that's that, that just some radical people pointing that out. But you can clearly see by looking at this why people are concerned about the climate threat. Now, you may be a little bit confused by what how I handle that, but I just wanted to share with you some hard data uh, on what's going on out there. Where, where you start is really important. So we're confused. Uh, you're as confused as this little boy who's filling out this form. Who is your hero? My father. Why did you consider this person a hero? He's not afraid of anything. Is there anything your hero is frightened of? <laughs> My mother. I love that. Uh, I love that little quote. Now, how quickly are we going to make this transition away from the use of fossil fuels? Well, the majority of petroleum is used for transportation, as I will show you in just a minute. And so the question is, and how big a threat this is to Louisiana, depends on how quickly electric vehicles will replace the internal combustion engine. 
Now, there is a, a world-renowned uh, energy economist by the name of Daniel Jurgen, who points out to us that there are some key gateways that EVs have got to go through before the electric vehicles are become the major source of transportation in this country. Uh, the first of these gateways uh, is the cost. Uh, in 1921, the Tesla Model 3 cost between $38,000 and $55,000. And if you look at the Kia, the Hyundai, the Chevy Boat, once again, you're getting price levels in that, prices in that general level. Compare that to the Toyota Camry, which costs $25,000. So one of the first gateways is getting the price of EVs down. Right now, they're about 52% higher than the price of a Toyota Camry, which means it's gonna be out of the range for the low income and the lower middle income person. Now there's an outfit called the UBS group that expects this differential to only be 1900 by 2022. And GM says they can, they can choose parity by 2025. And I think that's, th these are things that, I don't think the USBS is correct. I think GM may be right because if you start producing more of these economies of scale will bring down the cost. And, and maybe you'll start reaching parity. You will still have a problem that there are no used EVs around at a much lower price that is typical of the market for the uh, our poor our bottom <coughs> uh, uh, income earners and our middle income earners. Now, uh, there once you get your EV, there is a second very important gateway to go through, and that's range anxiety. Right now, the Tesla Model 3 will go 220 miles before it has to be recharged. The Kia 239, as you can see, the Chevy boat up to 260 miles. Uh, about a month ago, uh, GM indicated they could get the Silverado pickup to go 400 miles without needing a charge. Now, I'll give you kind of a reference point here. I, I gave testimony in a case up in Shreveport the other day. I had to drive from Baton Rouge to Shreveport, which is 250 miles. Had I made that trip in a Tesla Model 3, I would have had to stop somewhere around Natchitoches and recharge the car again. Now that brings up the uh, second, the third uh, 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 gateway that we've got to fix before these cars become prevalent, and that is the availability of a place to charge them. Uh, in Baton Rouge right now, there are 24 charging stations within uh, 10 miles of the city center. Now, most of these have two plugs, uh, as I understand it, for charging your car. Compared to, there are 30 companies providing gasoline in this area. For example, Shell has 37 stations, Chevron has 29. So, uh, and, and most of these have uh, anywhere from six to 15, 20 pumps. So the opportunities, the availability of filling up your internal combustion engine is much greater than this. But again, even in the, uh, the president's new bill, he wants to pass the infrastructure bill. Part of that is to have many more charging stations. So that will, that will help get us through that gateway. But once you get to the charging station, there is the issue of the charging time. For a Tesla Model 3 vehicle, if you're gonna use a three prong plug at home, it's gonna take you anywhere from a day to a day and a half to recharge your car. If you're so lucky as to have a seven kilowatt uh, plug at your house, you can actually take anywhere from eight to 12 hours. Now, by the way, um, if you're in a subdivision that has like 26 homes in it, uh, there's only about three of these homes that can have a plug this strong without having to totally redo the distribution, the electricity distribution system. The, the public connectors that we have here in Baton Rouge uh, uh, will recharge the car at about 30 miles per hour, which means it's gonna take you seven hours to, uh, to recharge your Tesla. So if I had taken a Tesla and I had to, uh, found a place in uh, Natchitoches to recharge it, I would have to take another seven hours for my car to get fully recharged to start making the trip again. Compare that to uh, what I actually did. It actually took me about five minutes to fill up my internal combustion engine. So you can see this is a this is a very tricky gateway for EVs to go through. And then there's the repairs issue. It recall <clears throat> it costs sixteen thousand five hundred and fifty dollars to replace the battery in the Tesla three. Now the uh, seller the dealers have overcome this by saying we're going to 
in, uh, we're going to uh, cover this battery for eight years or 100,000 miles. So that's one way to overcome that issue. But as you can see, that's a that is a that is a big one there. Then from there's another issue we've got to deal, and that is with the supply chain. Uh, batteries required rare earths, and these are much more concentrated than fossil fuels. You know, there's no there's no country in the world that produces more than 20 percent of oil, but fossil fuels are much more highly concentrated. For example, 50 percent of the global cobalt comes from the Republic of Congo, not always a real friend of the United States. A single EV contains more cobalt than 1,000 smartphones. 90% of the lithium <clears throat> comes from Australia, Chile, and guess who? China. As a matter of fact, 65% of all lithium batteries come from China. China has been looking forward and saying, we want to try to control all the rare earth supplies. If we can control that, then we've got them. Because if we people here in the United States try to start up a rare earth mine made to produce neodymium or uh, one of the other uh, rare earths, all they have to do is drop the price so low that it drives us out of business and they're still in control. So there are supply chain issues here. Then something else maybe you hadn't thought about, and that is the impact on the earth. A single 1,000 pound electric car battery requires extracting and processing 500,000 pounds of materials. There's gonna be an unprecedented increase in global mining ahead if EVs are really to work their way into the transportation market. Uh, to give you an idea of this, uh, the prime minister of the UK said they want to, all the cars in the UK, all the internal combustion engines be gone by 2050. Well, this gentleman, Professor Harrington of the British National Museum said that would require, just for the cars in the UK, all of the world's present production of neodymium, 75% of the world's lithium, and 50% of the world's copper. And that's the UK. Now, the UK has about a ninth the number of cars as the United States. For the US cars to go to all EVs would require the world's production of cobalt to increase by 18 times. The world's production of neodymium to increase by nine times. The world's production of copper to increase by four times. Think about the number of mines now. And to give you an idea of the mines, this is a picture of the Kennecott copper mine right outside of Salt Lake City. This is what you're going to start seeing all over the world. Okay. So this is not, this is not, this from an envir environmental standpoint, it's kind of interesting to think about which way we're going here separate and apart from all the supply chain issues. So if you look at all those gateways, how long is it gonna to take to go from the, the internal combustion engine to electric vehicles? Well, Daniel Jurgen quotes a leading investment bank that says by 2050, between 10% and 90%. <laughs> I bet you're thinking, I could do that. <laughs> but, so th that's an indication of the degree of uncertainty about how long it's gonna take of getting through these gateway issues that I mentioned. And you're going to have to, number one, will EVs be compelling to, to customers? Are you going to be able to overcome the range anxiety, the charging time, the price of the automobile enough where people just want to have one of these? More likely, the way this is going to happen is the government's just going to ban internal combustion engines. Okay, If you have people like Deb Halen in charge, that's what's going to happen. You're just going to ban it and force people to start using them. Um, now, so, so, so the, you know, there's, there's a set of folks out there who have bumper stickers, et cetera, that says, we just need to keep it in the ground. Well, even if you are able to completely replace uh, the internal combustion engine for transportation with uh, EVs, uh, that's only going to take about, that's going to take uh, cover about 73% of the present petroleum use. 27% of petroleum is used for other stuff. You would be stunned about how much you've used a petroleum product since you got up this morning. The shampoo, hair coloring, your shaving cream, toothpaste, toothbrushes and combs, lipstick, soft contacts. Just look at the list down here. You want to go play golf this afternoon? You're going to be using a petroleum product. You're taking notes with an ink ballpoint pen? Guess what? You're using a petroleum product. Somehow or another, you're going to have to figure out some way of, you know, every one of those electric vehicles is going to run on tires. And those tires are made with artificial rubber, which is a petroleum product. 
the steering wheels, the dashboard, the fan belt. All these things require petroleum. So we're gonna have to figure out a way to replace all these things that are part of our lives with something else. And that's, that's another thing that's gonna prevent this from just happening real, real quickly. Now, this transition is not gonna hit all states the same. You know, a state like Utah, a state like Arizona, Iowa, it's not gonna really impact them very much. But Louisiana is one of these states where the transition is going to be very serious. Uh, uh, we are the number two producer of oil in the United States, heavily much of that coming from the Gulf of Mexico, which Scott has made a great case to indicate that if you're gonna produce oil in the United States, this is where you ought to be producing it from an environmental standpoint. We're the number four producer of natural gas. Again, much of that heavily in the Gulf of Mexico, which is controlled by Ms. Halen and the Biden administration. We are actually the number two state in the nation in refining capacity. We have 18 refineries located in our state. For those of you who are Ole Miss graduates, this is a map of the United States of America that also shows the pipeline grid in the United States. And look at Louisiana. We have almost 93,000 miles of pipelines running under our state. Uh, that's enough miles of pipeline to circle the globe about four times. Very big industry for our state. Now, back in 2015, I'm sorry these data are so old, but back in 2015, I did some uh, work on the economic impact of these three sectors, oil and gas, refineries, and pipeline, on business sales, earnings, and jobs in the state. And uh, I'll call your attention to the bottom line here. Uh, now, this includes both the direct activities, the actual running of refineries, and then the multiplier effect. I mean, there's a lot of businesses who depend upon the money being earned at those refineries uh, to, for their own business, attorneys, accountants, e e e economists, et cetera. So there's what we economists refer to as the multiplier effect. When you include this in, as you can see here, I'm going to call your attention to two numbers. Number one, the earnings number, $19 billion in earnings can be traced back to the existence of these three industries. 262,520 jobs in our state can be traced back to the existence of these, these industries, either directly or through the uh, multiplier effect. Big, big numbers, as you can see. And then the impact on the state revenues. Now, what you'll notice is a lot of times when people say if the oil and gas industry goes away, we're going to lose royalties, rentals, bonuses, severance taxes, the taxes that the industry pays itself. But those are just the direct payments. That does not include the income that will be lost through the multiplier effect and the taxes on those income. If you add these two together, it turns out in 2016 to have been about $2 billion dollars. So don't, don't just look at the present direct impact on the state budget. you got to look at the multiplier in the fact pack too. And we're talking about an adjustment that a state is going to have to make that is really non-trivial. But not only is the state going to have to do it, but local governments are going to have to do it as well. As you can see here, uh, we estimated that about $1.2 billion in revenues comes to our local government. Some of this is direct. Matter of fact, if you look at most of the places where these refineries exist, they are typically the largest taxpayer in the parish. And then you have the money from the indirect, the multiplier effect. So this is this industry, there's a lot of adjustments that will have to make, be made in Fayette, federal, excuse me, in state and local government budgets in our, in our state if, the, if this goes away. By the way, the other thing we'll have to figure out if we go to all EVs is how are we going to finance roads? Right now, the roads financed with gasoline tax mainly, and uh, without the gasoline tax, we're just using EVs. And gee, how are we going to finance the roads? So you can see the transition here is going to be quite a revolution. Uh, oops, I want to share with you a resolution here to end up. Uh, this resolution, I'm giving up eating chocolate for a month. Uh, oops, bad punctuation. I'm giving up. I'm going to eat chocolate for a month. So. Anyways, you can see here, it's gonna be quite a transition uh, to make, uh, but I really think it's gonna happen much more slowly than we may anticipate. So thank you very much. I uh, hope, hope this was useful for you.
Thank you, Lauren. You know, I knew you were a doctor, but I didn't know your PhD was in sarcasm. Well done, sir. <laughs> Uh, also, Elon Musk called during your presentation. Your Tesla three is on the way, so get ready. So get oh, your electricity. You I can hardly wait. There you go. Well, I, we'll we'll get. We have time for just a couple of quick questions uh, before we have to uh, get out of here. And, and really, Scott, I'll throw this first one really uh, to to you. That you know, regardless of where one stands on, you know this what's going on with the climate and how much change needs to be embraced and how quickly, if at all. Uh, so regardless of where one stands on that, uh, it does seem that change is coming, whether it's going to be through regulatory change. I mean, it just seems to be happening. How quickly it happens, we don't know. That all being said, is it your sense that Louisiana industry is embracing this coming evolution or sort of fighting it? And where does it need to fall as it sort of rides this wave of change? Because, you know, Lauren is correct. I mean, there is an, in, an awful lot of economic impact that comes out of the fossil fuel industry. Uh, and how you manage that as things change is sort of critical to the lifeblood of Louisiana. Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think it, it, it starts, as, as Dr. Scott was saying, you know, when we talk about the direct and the indirect, um, it starts with somebody at the top spending the dollars, right? And what I have, I think, become to understand is that many of the major uh, oil and gas players in the world are uh, embracing um, climate change as something that they have to deal with uh, for whatever reason they make those choices. Uh, sometimes it's you know stakeholder, stockholder pressure, whatever it is. I, I, I think the, the record is very clear that several major employers in Louisiana who spend money on the drill bit and who spend money on pipelines and who spend money on refineries are embracing that it is real and they have to do something about it. Now, having said that, you know, we look and say, does that create, does that change create an opportunity for us? And clearly there's a lot of, you know, examples in America where change has created opportunity. To the degree that America, or let me say the world, is putting a premium as they look to this transition. I think Dr. Scott's right in terms of it will take time. But while it's taking time on the demand side, Louisiana has an incredible opportunity on the supply side that if the world wants less carbon intensive oil and they've memorialized it with 194 countries representing 74% of the world's population through the Paris Accord, we can help Mother Earth tomorrow morning or this afternoon here in the Gulf of Mexico by substituting those barrels for barrels that are coming from other countries. And again, this would not have been possible uh, had it not been for the fact that our men and women who do these jobs are so good at what they do and that we, since 2015, have embraced the exporting of those hydrocarbons. So there is a tremendous opportunity as the world puts a higher value on less carbon intensive barrels that we happen to have that situation here. And I think it's a it's a it's an opportunity. Look, I, 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 again, I'm not here to debate whether we should or we can or we must. I'm here to tell you that my observation at the highest levels of that it's happening, it's coming to a zip code near you. And when that change happens, uh, you know, you can't win the NFL Super Bowl by running the ball anymore. You got to have a quarterback that can throw. I grew up as, a, at, at, you know, we still play the game on 100 yards, but I grew up where a great quarterback had a huddle and he handed off the ball. Now a great quarterback doesn't need a huddle and he throws the ball. So look, the things are changing and I think we have to react. And I think we have a great story to tell about the, the Gulf of Mexico, which I think can, again, uh, we have to, we have to make sure that the, the administration in Washington understands that while they are looking for energy transition, that the Gulf of Mexico is one of those places that can respond to that opportunity. Uh, Lauren, you did a great, you always do a great job talking about the ripple effect of what happens in the, um, in the oil and gas industry throughout the Louisiana economy and the way it sort of flows uh, uh, through a lot of uh, independent contractors and others. Do you have a sense for 
uh, what the ripple effect potential is for some of the renewable energy sources out there? Does it come even close to matching what's going on in the fossil fuel side of it? Unmute myself a little bit. Um, uh, for example, um, if you look at the uh, solar farms that are being built across the river, uh, total employment at the solar farm is going to be one person. Now, as it turns out, there most of those persons, I think, as I appreciate it, are more engineering type folks. So their wage rates are going to be kind of comparable to the oil and gas side. But for Louisiana as a whole, I think we're going to, I think we're definitely going to end up on the negative side. The uh, uh, the uh, the refineries, uh, the refineries number one are the highest wage industries in the state. And they have one of the highest multiplier effects in the state uh, in terms of generating more and more income and jobs off of them. So my, my sense is that the transition is going to be uh, from high wage, uh, high multiplier effect jobs to lower wage, lower multiplier effect jobs. I, 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 haven't, I haven't seen the data yet to convince me that we can we're going to get a whole lot more jobs and we'll just switch to green. I'm just not convinced of that yet. Now, the, by the way, the, 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 the company that's coming in, Jay Harden's uh, 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 growing fuels plant that's coming into the port, that will be a refinery, a green refinery, making, uh, making a diesel out of things like, uh, I think that one is making diesel out of uh, food products, uh, excess food products. But uh, there again, that my guess is that's going to be a, a higher income area but uh going to wind and solar I, I think we're moving from we're moving from high income high multiplier to lower income lower multiplier effect job and so the the response just to jump in jr is that is that you know if that that's where the market goes that's there's not a whole bunch that folks can do i mean if that's where the market is going uh either through demand uh social issues uh public policy changes but what we can do is recognize that the value of those barrels that in the Gulf of Mexico that are largely supported by coastal communities, we need to grow our share of the world's production. We need to substitute, you know, the, the fact that maybe there will be less oil consumed in the world is perhaps a, a, a fact that's coming to a zip code near us, but we can, we can at the same time, while we observing that, have more Gulf of Mexico oil, not less, do a good job here and again, improve the health of mother earth. And so the follow-up to that would be, yes, I, I understand the concept of, hey, look, while this thing dwindles, Louisiana and the Gulf Coast area have proven, you know, we do it better, more efficient and safer than elsewhere in the world. So let's concentrate it here. You know, at the same time, it seems like the state of Texas, and we love to compare and contrast with Texas all the time in, in Louisiana, they seem to be moving pretty aggressively in the renewable field. Um, do we sort of have to keep pace for that? Because at some point, the change is going to happen. I mean, how fast it happens, we can debate. But, you know, if Texas gets the major foothold as being the, the center of a lot of renewables, what's sort of there for Louisiana? Yeah, I mean, I don't, from my standpoint, I don't think there's any doubt we got to keep pace. I mean, all you got to do is ask as a as a guy who was who was putting in home telephone lines 15 years ago to see if he what he thought about this this little cell phone thing, and and now you go to the public service commission month monthly and you see how many hard line uh, lines are being disconnected every month. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think you know we have a duty to understand that the world and react to what the world wants. And I, look, I think what Dr. Scott said is absolutely right in his facts, but um, I believe that it's not a rational, logical discussion that's going on in the world. And my concern is that if we embrace it too fast as a, a country, we wreck our economy. But do we in Louisiana need to be aware that there is you know, change and we need to adjust ourselves while the wind is blowing in a different direction and embrace and be part of that all of the above generation and embrace it all. Absolutely. No doubt. Yeah. Let me, let me, let me make one quick comment on that, uh, JR. Uh, one of the things, one of the reasons Texas is so far uh, ahead of us on, on the renewable side is because uh, uh, 
two two things. Number one, if you're if you're, I don't know if I've ever mentioned this to you or not, but I'm from Wink, Texas. And if you you go out around Wink, Texas, what do you have? You have sunshine all the stinking time, and you have wind, okay, all the time. I was just out in Lubbock. It's the wind is blowing constantly all the time. Uh, and so they're going to be ahead of us in wind and they're going to be ahead of us in solar, okay, because they have that area out around West Texas and the Panhandle and stuff like that where there's plenty of, there's a plenty of sunshine, plenty of wind. We don't have plenty of sunshine, plenty of wind, except in the Gulf of Mexico. And this is another area that I know Scott mentioned, and that is offshore wind farms. So that's one place we might kind of catch ahead, but we are not a windy place and uh, we're not, we're not, we get a lot more rain than Texas does. So we're, we're, we're not going to be at a competitive advantage, but we need to, as much as we can. If this is what's going to happen, this transition is going to happen, then we need to we need to figure out some way. And I think smart, smart, clever, greedy capitalists will do this. They'll figure out some way of handling this somewhere here in Louisiana, too. Well, Laura, a lot of people think I'm full of hot air. So if we can find a way to monetize that, we'd be, um, you know, we could be a leader in that. But unfortunately, uh, we're out of time. Uh, look. We could go on and on with these. I mean, it's so fascinating, but uh, we are trying to be respectful uh, of our audience and, the, and their other commitments, as well as the, the time that both you, Lauren, and Scott have given to us. So uh, I do want to say thank you to, you, to both of you all. Uh, and on behalf of 1012 Industry Report, I want to thank the audience for joining us as well. Uh, a reminder that a digital replay of this event will be available later today on 1012industryreport.com and Daily Report PM. I also want to express my appreciation to the sponsors of this webcast, the Alliance Safety Council, Bradley Merkinson, and the Port of Greater Baton Rouge. And of course, thanks to everyone in the audience for giving us some of your time this morning. Have a great rest of your day.